Alright. We are live. Can you tell me if we're on? We're on. I'm not sure what the audio is. Hey folks. Our second start of the night. Let us know if you can hear us all right and if you can see us. There's a couple of seconds delay, so as soon as I get a thumbs up from Frick, I'll begin. Anything yet, Frick? Okay, sound is good now. Sounds yeah, good? Yeah, you can hear much better. Every, everything's all right? We're go? I guess. Okay, welcome folks to our, I can't remember how many we've been, but this is our Saturday Night Live YouTube workshop to benefit our Purple Heart Project, which if you don't know, is where we bring in combat wounded veterans six times a year, this time seven. We bring in seven, pardon me, yes, seven times a year, and each time we bring in seven combat wounded veterans. We have seven spots for civilians as well. We do a six-day hand tool workshop, very intense. We start at, actually probably we get here at seven in the morning, and we work until 11 o'clock at night. We cover all aspects of building a piece of furniture with just hand tools. Each vet that is selected goes home with somewhere around three thirty-five hundred to $4,000 worth of premium hand tools, the ones that they will be using all week. They're brand new. And, and thanks to uh, Jack Lane, who is the, uh, who, uh, is the bench brigade, what do you call him? General? Who's in charge of a brigade? Well, you? Me. No, I'm, I'm throwing it out there. Oh, that's <laughs> Whatever it is, that's Jack. And, and Chris Chahusky, who's his uh, right-hand man in this, they build, they, build vet, they build benches to our spec, and uh, civilians do, I mean, and Jack organizes it, and they deliver it directly to the vet, which is uh, an incredible feat. So... Tonight's topic is saw sharpening, so we're taking your questions, the ones that you've already submitted, as well as live ones tonight. I'm going to get started, and we'll just do some more introductions after we get going a little bit. Frick, do you have anything for me? No. What is a saw? Yeah. Nothing? Uh, give me a second. I was too... All right. You're, you're uh, Fricks, Frick's in the... Let's, oh, let's start off with a dovetail saw. <laughs> so when it comes to sharpening, as in everything in dealing with woodwork, <coughs> we're talking about shaping wood with sharp metal tools. So they have to be sharp in order for them to work. And I might add that the biggest difference between a sharp tool and a dull is the amount of effort that is required to make it work. If the tool is sharp, it requires minimal effort. If minimal effort is expended by you, you're able to focus more on the control aspect. So if you were to chart this, this graph represents the amount of effort applied to make the tool work. This, this one determine, or, uh, signifies how much control you have. Well, the harder you push on that tool, the control, it's inversely connected. The, the control drops like this. They always say a dull tool is the most dangerous because Pushing this hard has li the least amount of control. And if you reverse that with a really sharp tool, it goes like this. And you have it, you're able to make it do whatever you want. Now, perhaps more applicable to a chisel, but it also works with planes and saws. So you want your saw to cut not only uh, relatively easily, but you also want to cut very clean so it doesn't leave a mess. And you also want it to leave a straight, uh, pardon me, a flat surface. So if you take a dovetail saw and make a cut with it, this is designed to rip. And if you go all the way down, the first thing you should notice is without any input from the user, from the sawyer, you should be getting a nice straight cut. Straight is defined as the shortest distance between two lines. So what I'm going to do is take this straight edge. Now it may not be, it may not be square to this face, it may not be plumb. That doesn't, that doesn't matter. I wasn't attempting that. I just want to make sure the cut is straight. So as I put this straight edge on there, you can see that it gave me a nice straight cut. No turns or bends to one side or the other. That has a lot to do with how sharp the saw is and the set. Now, why is that important? 
Well, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to cut that piece off and I'll show you. Perhaps the best demonstration for explaining why this is important. If you're cutting a dovetail, you want to be able to join your two pieces directly from the saw. If you have to go in and do anything to that surface after you've sawn it, that's extra work. It may requires extra time and your risk of screwing it up greatly increases. So after making that saw cut, if the cut was straight, the surface left behind, this one and this one, should be nice and flat. I just flipped it over so we're not matching grooves. So when I put those two pieces back together, you end up with a nice joint that can almost be seen or invisible. So typically you'd have the side of your tail and the side of your pin, and now when they come together like that, with glue, you get an appropriate joint that it ends up being stronger than the wood itself. Now, are, am I, am I, are we still, uh, everything's okay, Frick? Mm -hmm. Everything's okay? Okay, so here's what you need to know about. Each tooth on this saw is bent out from the saw plate. So we're gonna, I'm going to go very basic here for a moment. So this is the, the uh, spine. In this case, it's a piece of brass. This is the saw plate. Now this, this particular saw, which is known as a dovetail saw, is 10 inches, 10 inches long. I have an inch and 5 eighths depth of cut. The blade thickness is 20 thousandths of an inch. And that doesn't always resonate with people, so if you think of a piece of writing paper as being 4 thousandths of an inch thick, this is 5 sheets of thick paper thick. The tooth count on there, ignore the first one, the teeth that do the most of the work are 15. That means for every inch there are 15 points or 15 teeth. And those teeth are filed rip, meaning they are designed to plow through the wood in a cut that is parallel to the grain. So I just made a rip cut here. If I were to go this way, that would be a cross cut. We use a different saw for that. Not that this won't do it but the, the cross-cut saw will do it more efficiently. Just like we use a rip cut for doing this, a cross-cut saw will do that, but it's slow and less efficient. Next thing we need to know about this is that the cutting face of the tooth, that part of the tooth that engages the wood or bites, in this case, it is, re it is zero degrees. In other words, it's plumb, straight up and down. And the tooth falls back like that behind it. So each one of those teeth is going to do that work. You want them all in the same line. You don't want it wavy like this, which sometimes happens over years of multiple sawings. And you have to go in and fix that. It's called jointing it. So you want, you want the surface. Oh, really don't have something small enough to point. But you want the cutting face. The cutting face and the back of the tooth create the cutting edge. So when you sharpen, you have to address both that face and that top in order to get a nice sharp edge and you can tell if it's sharp because when you just run lightly run your fingers on it you should feel it grab readily if your saw if your fingers more or less slide over it obviously your teeth are dull and the last thing you need to know is the set so if you were to look down there and if you were to look under some magnification what you would see is this tooth is bent either that way or that way I can't tell but let's assume that it's a bent to my right so if the first point is bent, bent to my right the next point is bent to my left and the next one to my right left right left right all the way down these teeth are bent so that when it plows through the wood I'll do this again and by the way, this applies to essentially all rip saws. When that tooth goes through the wood, or those teeth goes through the wood, go through the wood, what we need them to do is to uh, make a kerf or a groove, we call that a kerf, that is a little bit wider than this saw plate is thick. So if those teeth are bent out from the saw plate, then the resulting groove, kerf, whatever you want to call it, is going to be wider than this. In my case, I have my teeth set at two thousandths of an inch per side. That same sheet of paper that we were referencing for the thickness of the saw plate, take a half a sheet of paper, that's how far the teeth stick out on this side, and another half a sheet, that's how far they to stick out on that side. So if my saw plate is twenty thousandths, my kerf is going to be twenty thou plus two thou plus two thou for a total of twenty-four. And what that means is it will allow the saw to pass through freely without binding, 
but it also means that the sides of the of the uh, kerf, this side, I'll put an arrow on them, that side and that side actually rub or come very close to rubbing on the side of the saw plate and what that does is it prevents the saw from being able to wander to the left or to wander to the right and it holds the saw on track and causes it to what we call track which means it continues on that path. The only downside to that is when you start your dovetail you can't start like this and then oh shoot I need to change that and try to bend it. You're committed to that angle. Not to worry, that has nothing to do with how well it'll fit. And the ability to get that on the right angle will come with a little bit of time. But not important in this case, it, what is important is that the cut be nice and straight. So that is your ripsaw. Questions? I was stalling for time. How, where are we, Frick? Um, okay, first question is from, just gave the initials, LS. And he's from Washington, D.C., and he says, how do you tell when it's time to resharpen your saw? Well, that's a good question. So I kind of already answered that, but I'll go over it again. Uh, there's a couple of ways. The first, uh, the first way is when you're sawing, and you're sawing, and you're sawing, and you're sawing, you're not getting anywhere. Well, obviously, there's something wrong. You should have, if you could see them, you should have little chunks of wood back here if it's a rip saw. But you should, it should saw aggressively enough that without applying, let, let, I'll, show, I'll, I'll, I'll show you. I'm going to try to only support the weight of the saw, move it forward and back. Now I've got my hand like this, so I'm not pushing down on it, and yet it is still managing to cut. Okay, so that saw, although it's not brand new, it is sharp enough that it's doing the job well. So how it performs in the wood is always going to be your best test. And you're also going to want to be able to stand back and make sure it doesn't drift to the left or drift to the right. That would mean that you've got to fix the set. Next way of telling is just take your fingers and just lightly run your fingers over. So this saw is designed to cut on the push. So if I pull my hand this way, I don't feel anything. But if I bring it this way, I should feel those teeth grab the skin of my fingers just enough that I can tell. Okay, that's not allowing it to slip. So it's grabby. It's good and sharp. Other thing you can do, get yourself a pair of magnifiers like this and take your saw and just look at it. And if you can see the points, if the points of the teeth are the least bit shiny, they'll actually stand out if they're dull. It's not hard to tell. You look at it this way and I can see some shiny points on there, which means that that, that has lost its sharp edge. It's not going to perform as well as it could. So... Does it grab how it performs in the wood? And can you see shiny points? I would say are probably the three easiest ways to tell whether or not your shar needs, your saw, your shar, your shar needs sharpening. Your saw needs sharpening. I get the idea. Um, Luther says that someone should get the wooden models of sawtooth patterns right he made. We got them. We got them. All right. They'll come into play. Just make sure. I should mention that uh, Luther is on tonight. Retired Colonel Luther Sheely, Mr. Awesome. He's out in, uh, is he home this weekend? Yes, he is. So he's in Washington, D.C., Washington State, sorry. He lives in Roy, and he's currently taking a uh, three-month course in um, Port, Townsend. Port Townsend Woodworker School. <laughs> so... Kudos to Luther and all of his roomies. And Super Dave is on. Super David Benson, combat wounded veteran. Uh, half his career in the Navy, half in the Army. Veteran from uh, the Iraq, uh, pardon me, Afghanistan. And Dave's uh, part of our Purple Heart Project. He helps, he takes care of the last half of the uh, three of the six classes. Super Dave's on. I believe Ken is on helping us tonight. Ken Anthony works in here with us. Ken actually runs the production in this shop. Uh, Megan will be here soon. Jake's behind the camera. Frick is over there. With? With? Rob Cosman Jr. Oh, young <laughs> Bendeley. Very Bendeley. Hey, Rob Cosman Jr. <laughs> he needs to wash his spaghetti off his face. Am I forgetting anybody? 
Santa Claus. Santa Claus and his wife, who are the generous donors that take care of the prizes, most of the prizes that we give away tonight, in addition to the prizes that come, come from my friend Moose at Pat's Secret Garden. We'll tell you that in a little bit later. Okay, next question. All right, next question comes from RJ in Virginia. Hi, RJ in Virginia. He says, how do I make a shop-made saw, saw vice? A shop? How do I make a shop-made saw vice? A shop-made saw vice. Good question. But I can't give this one away because we got a YouTube coming out when? Within the next couple of weeks. But there it is. Now, here's uh, speaking of saw vices, uh, these used to be really common. Um, I'll just tell you a quick little story. When, when my father left Montreal, I think it was in 1962, he had been teaching uh, woodshop there at school, left that career to move back to New Brunswick and uh, carpenter contractor. And uh, this was right up until uh, when I was old enough to kick around on the job site. A lot of times they would show up and there was no power available. It might be a month before you had power. And I remember that the lumber truck would come and they would dump a pile of green, often called pond dry because it was soaking wet, lumber, two by four on the ground. And they would line them all up, flush up one end, chalk a line, however many inches up from each end. And then they would start him with a handsaw and they would literally cross cut across that great big long pile of two by four. And that was how you got your studs. So everybody knew how to sharpen a saw. And uh, things like saw vices and files and saw sets, these were common items. I mean, you could buy them in a hardware store. Well, you can't buy them now, but yet in a specialty store. And I'm old enough to remember up until I was probably 30 that there was a, an old guy that lived on the west side of the city and he had a saw sharpening service. You could take your handsaw to him and he would sharpen your saws. You don't find that very often anymore. So you really have to learn how to do this stuff yourself. So a saw vise, this is a, 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 a what we call a store-bought saw vise. And it's just designed so that whether, whether you're doing a dovetail saw or a cross-cut saw like this, it's designed so that when you put your saw in there, the teeth are just above the top. And it securely holds them so that it doesn't vibrate when you're, when you're filing. Now, if you don't have one of those, you can make one of these. And if you pick up Tay Fred's book, Tay Fred, as name, that is spelled T A G as in golf, E. Last name is spelled F R I D. He wrote a, a series of three books. Tay Fred was one of the founders of Fine Woodworking Magazine and really was, uh, I don't know if you could call him the father of uh, hand tool woodworking in North America, but if he isn't, he'd be close. He wrote three books. And his one on joinery shows you how to make this vise. A couple pieces of plywood. Piano, you can use a piano hinge, and I have two butt hinges there. A couple pieces of hardwood so that when you set it in there, it stays level with your bench. And a couple strips of hardwood in here. So when you put your when you put your saw in there, it performs the same function in terms of supporting the uh, the teeth right up there and now when you file it's held in place now I sometimes come in and put a clamp across there and across there to give it a little more support so I think I'll design a little bit of a better one this is one I'd actually modified for uh, because I used to sharpen a lot of Lee Nelson saws when I sold them and I modified it so this Lee Nelson saw would fit in there so I didn't have to uh, take the handle off in order to get the teeth sharpened so watch, watch, make sure you're on our YouTube channel, make sure you subscribe, because one of our next videos coming out is going to be on uh, all aspects of sharpening saws, including making a vise. In fact, I think making a vise is going to be the first one, right? Yeah. Next, Rick. All right, next question comes from uh, Nigel B. He's in the chat with us tonight. Hi, Nigel. He says, what is your opinion on hybrid cut saws? Would you recommend the use on a panel saw? You know, I was just reading uh, something that Ian Kirby wrote, and um, uh, just a second here. Let me just gather my thoughts on what I was going to tell you. 
Uh, I don't know if it's quite applicable or not. It's funny. I started thinking of that. I said, well, that might not work. So let me go to your question. A hybrid saw. So there's two types of saws. I, I do this little demonstration all the time, but it always seems to drive the point home, so we'll do it again. Okay. Here is a rip saw. So a rip saw, where do you find a rip saw? And if, if I'm, I'm going to try to start my comments very basic. So if, if I'm starting too low, let me know. And if I'm hitting the sweet spot, let me know that too. So there's a dovetail saw that has rip teeth. We call this a, a tenon saw. I actually call mine a medium tenon because of the size. That's a rip tooth. This is what you would, I would call a full-size tenon saw. You notice the depth of cut. That's a rip tooth. Um, here's a uh, carcass saw, and that's a small rip saw, a panel saw. This is designed, what, what did I call it? Carcass. carcass. I meant to say a panel saw. This is designed to rip, and then they get bigger. They go up from there, get even bigger. I have, there's even some small ones. Here's a... Here's a small dovetail saw, still in the works. That has a rip tooth. And then you have crosscut teeth. I'll, do, I'll talk about that in a second. So a rip tooth looks like if you took a bunch of chisels and put them all in a line, that's what a rip tooth looks like. It consists, the tooth consists of two surfaces, the front and the back. Those two surfaces create the cutting edge, just like a chisel. So when you're ripping a piece of wood, your chisel manages to go through there and cleanly sever the fibers, knocking out chunks of wood and leaving a nice, or I should say relatively nice, clean cut. See how that works? Now, if you take a cross cut and apply it, pardon me, thank you, Jake. If you take a rip tooth and apply it to an operation where it's cutting across the grain, what you end up experiencing is more of this. Can I continue? Yeah, yeah, keep going. Okay. So here's what happens. See that? Not very clean. Okay. So what you want in this case is you need to have something that will come in and sever those fibers. So I'm going to take a square and I'll come in here like this. I'll do it on this side. A crosscut tooth have these uh, a three-sided point, kind of like this knife. And those sharp points will come in there and they'll sever those fibers. I'm going to do it on both sides. Actually, I'll do it the same size as the... It severs fibers on both sides. And now when you're... when you're, I didn't do it wide enough. Okay, bear with me a minute here. I'll just make this a little wider. The teeth on either side sever the fibers. And those little... What's left... <laughs> this is not working. Well, okay, what's supposed to happen is it goes in there and it gives you a nice clean wall on either side of that trough or that kerf and the fibers in between just kind of disintegrate. Sorry about my example. It didn't work quite the well, as well as I'd like. So the question is, can we get a hybrid saw? Well, it's a lot like over here with my table saw. We have... We have a rip blade here. Now this blade has teeth just like I described. They, they cut square on the top. There's just this face and that face. That creates your cutting edge. There's fewer teeth on the, so on the uh, blade than on a cross cut. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, compare it to this one. Here's a cross cut, a fine cross cut. See how many extra, see how many more teeth there are? 24 to 80. 24 versus 80. And these teeth, if you'll notice, mm -hmm. are pointed. See, there's a point that sticks up here, and then the next one there's a point that sticks up here. So you've got one, two, three surfaces creating that cutting edge. 
and those points go in there and sever the fibers. The little bit of dust left in between just falls away and you get a nice clean cut. If you have a combination blade, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to parlay this into what we're talking about. Yeah. This is a combination blade. So what this does, it has both types of teeth. It has one, it has uh, the cross cut, and then usually every one and every four or five, <laughs> this one back here, is designed to remove the material. So it's, it's, uh, it's okay, it works. A lot of people, that's all they do. They only use a combination blade. Uh, it does a fine job of cross cutting. It's slow at ripping in comparison. And so, it give you as nice of a cross yeah, with a sharp cross cut blade and 80, how many was that? 82? 80 tooth blade? That'll give you a, a beautiful cut across the end of a piece of wood. Whereas the cross cut, the uh, combination will give you a nice cut. This will give you a beautiful cut. Dig the difference. The rip cuts fast, very, very efficient. So, if you go to a combination handsaw, what you're trying to do, instead of buying two saws, you're trying to get one. Well, the, the, uh, what you save in cost, you pay for in performance. Because the crosscut saw is going to do the best job on crosscutting, not as good as the combination. The rip saw is going to do the best job at ripping, not as, uh, and the combination won't do as well. So, uh, personally, you're only going to buy these once in your life. Buy what you buy the best tool for the job, then you never have to have the excuse that your tool wasn't up to you. I always tell people, I said, look, buy the very best tools, learn to use them, eliminate all the tool excuses, and you're off to the races. My two cents. Frick, question. What do we uh, What do we win in tonight? What do we win tonight? Oh, all right. How many people do we have on? Uh, about seven hundred. Okay, so tonight's thanks to Harold. I gotta tell you, Harold's not grass. Would Harold be one of the best additions we've had to our shop in a long time? Tell you a quick story about Harold. Well, probably since Chloe. Since Chloe? Can she hear? So if she hears, she's gonna want to race. So Harold was a local cabinet maker. He's uh, three years older than me, so he went to school with my sister, but I knew who he was. And then as I got uh, into my career, he, he I did furniture. And uh, he did cabinets, and the, the difference is that everybody needs cabinets, and very few people need furniture, so he had lots of work I didn't. Anyway, uh, he ran into a situation where he had uh, a serious health problem, and he called me up one day and said, Rob, I, uh, I, I got I to gotta hang up my shingle. Hang up my shingle. You want to buy my equipment? So I went up, and uh, I bought everything he had. That's where that big bandsaw came from. That's where that jointer came from. Uh, uh, another saw we got um, what's it called Jake scroll, scroll saw over there that's where that came from anyway Harold lived I don't think he was planning on it and uh, he showed up here about a year ago one day and he said Rob he says uh, if you ever need help I'd, I'd be interested in maybe spending a day or two a week here I said Harold come on in so we put him to work right away his one day or two one day one or two days a week is now full time he and Ken are both just... Involved. Yeah, he and Ken just work part-time. And, uh, the, I mean, Harold is uh, he's talented. I just tell him what I need, and he makes it. And it's, wow. He's happy, I'm happy. So, Harold... Uh, Harold spends most of his time just building shooting boards. And we have a new shooting board. It's called a Mini. It's designed to use with your, with your block plane. It works beautifully. If you're looking for small detail stuff... I'll show you real quick what I was doing the other day. We did a we did a YouTube on um, we did a YouTube on the best ways. Is that has that has an air? Oh, don't give away. Oh, you got to watch YouTube. Anyway, I needed to manipulate a little wee tiny piece. Literally, it was an eighth of an inch by three sixteenths by a quarter of an inch long, and that's just a little awkward to do with your five and a half on the big on the big shooting board. So I'm able to come over here. Actually, this is my mini. This is the one I made, and then Harold's been producing those off of it. So I'm able to come in here with my block plane, and you can come in. And nice thing about it, too, is you can close the throat down, so you have very little exposure to the blade. And you can come in there, and you can do this, get the smallest detail work. It's fantastic. We have both left and right. <clears throat> so we're going to give away... 
We're going to give away one of these tonight with each $1,000 increment we reach in donations to the Purple Heart Project. We will send you your choice, either left or right, mini shooting board. Uh, we also tonight, our friend Moose, patsecretgarden.com. Most people in Grand Bay now wear a dead cat because these are the warmest things. So if all my friends in Texas who are suffering in the cold, hurry and get your dead cat to warm you up. We're going to give away one tonight. We're going to give away a Captain is Always Right hoodie. It says on the side of the hood, I'm the captain. A Naughty Girl sweater made famous by Frick. You tell us the size and we'll send you whichever one. We do this every, we, every night we do this. Moose uh, helps us out with that. Big thanks to him. Um, and don't forget, sweeten things up. We have our maple syrup. And read the comment section to find out how good that is. Reviews. Especially the one by uh, McLaren last two weeks ago. And don't forget our t-shirts. Help us promote our Purple Heart Project. Frick next. Is the... Uh is the mini shooting board available for purchase yet? Not yet. This is the first crack at it tonight. It will go up maybe Monday. It could be up as soon as Monday. We got a good supply of them. Harold just finished them up on Friday. We thought we'd just jump the gun by giving away the first ones tonight. But it'll be ready very soon. All right. Rick Rhodes in the chat. Hi, Rick. He says, I have a very slight bow along the tooth line of my dovetail saw. Brass back is dead straight. Will it present a problem? Good question. So, Rick is looking down, and Rick, correct me if I'm wrong, Rick is looking down his tooth line, this is the tooth line, and he sees a slight bow. In other words, the saw is doing this, right? Now, is it going to create a problem? Well, if you, uh, if, let's say we had, let's say we had a sixteenth of an inch bow deviation from straight, front to back, over a ten inch blade, we're going to be in, even if we're in one inch of wood, if you do the math on that, it's hardly detectable. But I understand people want it to be straight. So you can easily straighten it. And the easiest way to do it, uh, since you don't have a soft uh, uh, hockey skate straightener like we do, is to take two pieces of wood, two small pieces of wood. I'll, I'm, I'm going to use these. Take two pieces of wood like this and put them put them on either side of wherever the bow is. And then you can come in and you may as well may as well protect your investment. Take another piece of wood and put it on the, the center of where that, you know, if my uh, if my bow is is if frick, what's the word? If we have a bow, it's like that. What's the center of the bow? Is there a way of re referencing in that? School teacher. Let me, I'm not a school no. teacher. <laughs> You're supposed to be. So find the center, let's just say that. Find the center of your bow. Or in this case, it's going to be your hump, right? The, it, it, this, if I was fixing this, it would be because it was humped like that. It's called the I, riser. The riser? The center, the riser is the center piece of the bow. Okay, the upper and so lower find the, the riser, and then you would simply put your clamp on there and just uh, start applying some pressure. Now, what you need to realize is, actually, you're probably better off doing this one. Oh, someone's saying it's the either, it might be called the crown or the fulcrum? The crown would be good. The crown would be good. Apex. And just with your, with your clamp, apply some pressure and then let it go. Now, here's the funky part. Because of the, it's brass and it's going to have a little spring to it, you're going to have to bend a little bit beyond. So it's up like this. You're going to want to bend it down like that. It's because it's going to come back a little bit. And just play with it a little bit. And it's not that hard. Don't go easy. Don't go heavy. And you'll eventually get it to the point where you look down that tooth line to be perfectly straight. We do this routinely. Every saw, not every saw. Well, How many? We check every saw. Yeah, we check every saw. Probably five out of every ten saws have to have a little bit of straightening done after we build them. It's not a big deal. Just don't want to mark up your brass. That's why I said use the use the pieces of wood, pieces of wood and a clamp and, and a, a straight edge. He didn't he didn't specify whether or not it was uh, your saw. He just said his dovetail saw. Yeah, well, no, it, it, it would. I mean, it's common on. It's just common. It's not a big deal. Easy to fix. All right. Clay, thanks for asking too. That was a good question. Clay Wiscombe in the Hi, Clay. the chat also. He says when using my grandfather's big hand saw to rip with it starts vibrating under the piece. 
of wood on the pullback stroke. I have waxed it on the sides. How can I overcome this problem? Okay, I was thinking when he said, uh, I was thinking of a big ash saw. So say that again. Read that again to me, please. When using my grandfather's big hand saw to rip with, it starts vibrating under the piece of wood on the pullback stroke. Wait a minute. Under the piece of wood on the pullback I, stroke. I don't know if he means under the piece of wood. Oh, yes, it does. So when he, when he goes through and he's pulling it back, the blade that's underneath is wobbling. Oh, okay, okay. Hmm. So let's recreate that. I'll grab my rip. I don't know what happened with that. No, but I, I'm just going to try to uh, imagine where he is. So here I've got a piece of wood. So your saw, well, mine, mine, can, mine will do that a little bit too. So vibrate a little bit on the pullback stroke. Why does it do it? I don't know. Smoothness of cut, smoothness of, it probably is going to be a combination. It might be, might it be because it's not sharp enough? I doubt it because that's on the backstroke. Why would it be, why would it be, would it be vibrating? That one's a mystery. Can't even make anything up. But I, uh, it's, if it bothers you, <laughs> what do you do to eliminate it? Go slow? I really don't know, Clay. I, that's, uh, that's a good question. If somebody, has a, if somebody has an answer, speak up. We'd like to hear it. I wonder if it's perfect or small. Well, mine's not, and, that, and it does it a little bit too. It vibrates a little bit too on that backstroke. Don't know. Sorry, can't answer that one. Next, Frick. Couple, couple suggestions. Someone said maybe the wood is wet. Um, well, maybe. See, so Clay said he put. Put wax on both sides. Let me just, in case you're not wondering what Clay meant by that, using, wait for it, commercial coming. Where is it, Jake? Using your Cosman Magic Wax, come in here and just do a little squiggly line like that on either side of your saw. If you want to, you can use your fingers like this to just kind of spread it a little bit. And that will just, that'll allow that saw to slide through that wood that much easier. So if you're dealing with wet wood, which has a tendency, the fibers have a tendency to close in on the blade, that'll help, that'll help uh, Oh, no. Eliminate or at least lessen that problem. I think it's it would be more likely to whip if it, the longer it was as well. Someone said there yes. might be uh, too much set. Uh, too much set, or possibly someone... too because you've got the vibration of as you're pulling it back. You've got each of the teeth hitting it on either side. That's probably actually a pretty good. That is quite possibly a good answer. I don't know if it's too much set, but I would assume it's the set that's doing it because remember, every other tooth is sticking out. So as you're dragging it back through like that, the saw the saw below is not under any kind of tension, so it's able to flop around a little bit. I don't think it's a big issue. Next, Frick. Okay, next question um, comes from Paul Forsland in Appleton, Wisconsin. Hi, Paul. He says, Rob, what do I need to sharpen my father's old hand saws? Well, let's go through and uh, let's go through and sharpen, sharpen this one of mine. So here's my uh, here's my Lee Nelson rip. By the way, I uh, I really like these. I really like Lee Nelson saws, but good luck trying to get one because they are. Uh, I don't think they're even even making them right now. So you need a vise. So you're going to have to have something, and you can get creative with this too. You don't have to have a, a designated vice. You can make one. You, I've, I've been at um, uh, out demonstrating at a store. We didn't have anything at all, and I just took a couple pieces of wood and clamped them in the vice, something just to support the teeth so that they don't vibrate when you're sawing. So you need that. 
you're going to need a file. So you want a, uh, a triangular file. You want it to be sharp. And uh, I believe that they say that you should have about a third of the tooth should be, so if you were to take the face of this, I don't know why they say this, but if you take that distance from there to there, the tooth should come up to about a third of it, a little better than that. I don't think, I don't understand why that matters, but I just, it's uh, that one of those quotes from they, whoever they is. So you need a file. You need, probably good to have a pair of magnifiers, especially the older you get, so it's nice to have uh, I mine are di uh, three diopter, whatever that means. I think it has something to do with where it's in focus. Take some of the dust off of them. You want lots of light. Pour the light on. If you want to, you can come in like this. Now, I, I, asked, I asked Rex. He must not have been able to find it. He was going to bring me back a Sharpie. You can go in and you can paint all the teeth. And the reason you paint all the teeth is you... In case you stop, and when you restart, it's easy to tell where you've been because there's Sharpie missing, or there's ink missing on the last tooth that you actually sharpened. So we've got a file, we've got a vise, we've marked the teeth. Now you're going to want some way of determining uh, the angle. If you're doing a rip saw, you're going to keep the file is going to be perpendicular to the run of the blade. So in plan view, if I put a square on here like this, the, there's no, this, the, the cutting face, the angle on that, if there is, is referred to as the fleam. Well, on a rip saw, there typically is no, is, there is no fleam or no angle. So it's square right across there. And that's a pretty easy one to judge. And if you're off one or two degrees, it's not gonna matter. Then you gotta determine your cutting face. Cutting face or that angle of attack, um, I forget what the word is, that, uh, the rake angle, yes, that, I prefer that to be zero, so if I put my, if I put a square on there like that, that cutting face is going to be just like that. You can, if you want it to be a little more relaxed, if you have a hard, if you're cutting some really hard wood and the saw is really biting and binding on you then you can ease it off by decreasing de decreasing the aggressiveness of that tooth by backing that face off a little bit in fact when we make our our full-size tenon we have those teeth backed off about 10 degrees to make it just a little more comfortable for people who aren't used to doing this all the time um, last thing i'm going to do is take a little piece of a popsicle stick if you will <coughs> And I'm going to drill a hole in it, right in the middle. I just grabbed a different saw, a different file. So I'm going to set that in there. Now you can do it one of two ways. You can just recreate the angle that you already have. Oh, that's not big enough. Give me a second here. What have I got, Jake, that I can open that up with? The round rasp? No, it's from Jake. Why not just a drill? Well, I just didn't want to have to run to the other side of the shop. I'll try this one. Okay, so I got a relatively small piece of wood. I'm going to put the end of the file in that piece of wood. I'm going to set my square on here, and I'm going to hold that file like that. I'm going to take this piece of wood, and I'm going to put it on there. Let's go back and check it. So if I do that and I do that, okay. So when this this cutting face is plumb, that pe that popsicle stick is level. So now I'm going to be able to tell whether I'm tipping one side or the other. So I'm going to come in here, starting on that first tooth, and depending on how bad 
my uh, saw is. Now that's. That vice isn't holding very well. No, I got I got this kind of set up so that we could do it here in front of the camera, but normally I'd have it in the back of the shop held much more securely. So let me just put in another. See if we can't get this thing not to move. Okay. And this this is a little less than desirable too. It's not. Uh, it's not holding that as tight like I wish. Just do this. Vibrate. Ones. So I'm going to go through. And I'll skip over. Do the same number of strokes on each tooth. Now. Yeah. I do somewhere. This is a. Uh, I'd be better off with my own. If I can. Uh, there. Now it's tight. Wait a minute. Now I didn't get it. I didn't get a standing palm. Okay. Let's hope it doesn't happen again. Now I go back in here. Which tooth did I last finish? This one. Two, three. Skip over. Skip over. I'm doing three just because of the condition that the teeth are in. Might only need to do one, two, You're hurting the ears of uh, the people wearing headphones. Apparently. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, you get the picture. Now I can feel those teeth. Although I can actually see, if you can get in there tight, Jake, I can still see a dull spot on the end of some of those points. So I probably need to go through and do four strokes. I don't know if you can pick that up or not. So that's how you sharpen it. And you don't have to do anything to it. You don't have to go from one side for half the teeth and the other side for the other half like you do on a cross cut. It's not necessary. Now, you also want to make sure that the tooth line is nice and straight. So, as I sight down there, I want that to be a nice straight line. If it's bowing or, or if it's sunken in in one area just because bad sharpening over the years, you're going to have to go in there and joint it. I really don't want to do that to this saw because it doesn't need it. But to joint it... You would take a flat file, with absent a handle. Always best to uh, put together some kind of a little jig. So a block of wood. Cut a groove in the block of wood so that you can set your... Set this up a little higher. Set your file in there like that. Set it rested on here and just run it down there. And you're going to keep doing that. What you're doing is you're jointing it. You want it to be straight. So you're going to file off the high offending teeth. And you'll just watch to see when you just start to touch the last of the teeth. So if I had a real bad belly in there, these would all be flat, 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 less flat, less flat. And then these ones are almost sharp. I just started to touch it. And when you do that, all the teeth have been touched. Then you know you're back to being straight. Now you got to come in and reshape them. So you're going to come in and you're going to set your tooth in that gullet and you're going to file with that until you get it back into shape with all the rest of them so you don't have little teeth, big teeth. How am I going to file a saw if it hurts people's ears? Okay, so the question was, how do I get my grandfather's saw? What do I need? Right. I guess I'm in a little bit far. So you need a vise. You need a file. You need some magnifiers. You need lots of light. Get yourself a little popsicle stick so you can tell... And you're probably going to want a square or a, a, a bevel gauge, something, so that you can establish your angles. And then just a little bit of patience. It's not hard. Get a marker. Don't forget a marker. Forget who told me that. I think it was Tom Lee Nielsen. But if you go in and paint all those teeth, then you can tell where you've been. Because if you end up filing on the same tooth twice, that's going to make that tooth small compared to the rest. And all the teeth got to do the job. Many hands make light work. Many teeth make cutting easier. Next, Rick. 
Okay, before I read the next question, I want to give a shout out to Eric and Lisa Allman. I work with Lisa. You know Eric. He's been out here. He's a local. I told him I'd give him a shout out tonight. So, hello, Lisa and Eric. You didn't authorize that with us. It doesn't matter. (laughs) I run the show. Remember. Now Megan's over there, so I want to say something too. If there if there is any combat wounded vets that have been to our class, if you're if you're uh, Purple Heart Purple Heart Workshop alumni. Please speak up. We'd love to give you a shout out and recognize you there. And I, I always like to know that you're here and, and just touch bases with you. So, Megan. Yeah, we have a few. Oh, we want to. Sh- yeah, she's not mic'd. Yeah. Well, she is mic'd. It. It's, it's not plugged in. Do it after the next question. I have to. I unhooked it when I was troubleshooting the sound. Okay, so put that on hold. So, t- how do you tell them how to do it? What do they do to. Um, if they just mention it in the chat. If you type the at symbol that you use in, when you're doing an email, you type that first and then start typing Megan's name, M-E-A-G-A-N, and uh, you click on her name. That way she gets notified. Okay. So please say hello, and we'll uh, recognize you in a minute as soon as we get the mic set up. Go ahead, next. Okay, next this comes from Michael Hansen. Hi, Michael. He's in the chat with us, and he says, how do I determine the appropriate set when restoring a handsaw? So that's a, that's a good question. They're all good questions. That one is going to take a little bit of explaining. So if you come over here, I've got several saw sets. So this is another one of those situations where uh, we have a loud mouse. It's another one of those situations where you used to be able to get these readily. Now they're a little harder to come by. All of the this is a new one, so they are still being made. Um, these are ones that I've picked up at uh, Antique. You know, I paid $10 for it. And, uh, antique tool. What do you call it? Flea markets. So I'll use this one as an example. What, what was the question? Oh, how do you determine the set? Okay. So this thing right here, this round thing is called the anvil. And if you were to look at it, It starts with a very steep angle on this face, and as you spin it around, the angle is less and less and less to when you come back to here. In fact, I'm going to move this and let you see. Jake, can you see the difference if I hold that somehow? Can you see the difference of the slope on that disc, that anvil? Okay. So so there's your plunger. So what's going to happen is the big piece is going to come out and it's going to grab the saw blade. Let me actually put a blade in here. And by the way, this is really hard to see, so you definitely want magnifiers. So here's what happens. Your saw, gonna, your saw goes down there like that. So your saw teeth are going to rest. You can see where mine have already scratched the paint away. So that's going to determine the depth. And then... The, this, there's a, this, when I squeeze this trigger, there's two actions, two things that take place. There's a big plunger that comes out, and it, it writes the blade to the anvil. And then there's a little plunger. See that little plunger right there? You want that little plunger to be on the, on the, centered on the tooth. So when I squeeze it like that, that little plunger comes out, and it pushes the tooth over against the anvil, controls how far it goes, and then the tooth, the steel is such that when bent, it'll stay there. Now, the problem is, and this is where it really gets dicey, is you've got to go in and mark each tooth. Or on, on this side, I'll put a little mark. I'll show, actually, instead of exp- talking about it, let me actually show you how. So, Jake, let me sit beside you here. So what I'll do... Now, mine are already marked from the way you, they're set when we get them. So, I'm going to put a black mark on every other tooth. So, the teeth that I'm blacking out are bent that way. Once you find out the first one, it's easy to do because then you're just going to do every other one. And then in this case... That one, that one, that one, that one. Okay. So this has to be done from both sides. i got to keep my magnifiers on. Uh, it would be nice to have a stool somewhere where you can sit down so you can concentrate on what you're doing. 
Now I would have this one set for the minimal amount of me, least amount of set I can get on there, which might be more than I want. So I'll show you how I fix that. So then I would go in here like this. Are you in, are you in real tight? I'll try to hold it steady. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to push the plunger. And that's going to push that tooth over. And then I'll slide it over to this one. And I'll do the same thing. And I've got to go all the way down. And then I've got to turn around and come back the other way. And I'm going to go in those teeth that are marked. And each tooth will get pushed over. And each tooth will have the same amount of set. In other words, it's going to push it over an equal amount. Now, if it's too much, and for my liking, it usually is. In fact, I've got to go through and try to figure out how to modify one of these. That's why I got a bunch of them. I want to modify one of these so that um, I can get the absolute minimum amount of set. If you end up having too much set, uh, let's... Have I got a saw that I can play with? We'll take one of these. This is a uh, hardware store specialty. I've already done this. But that set is pretty good. If that was too much, what I would do, I would take a uh, steel, uh, pardon me, a, a diamond plate. I say that because if you try to use any other kind of stone, you're going to cut a groove in it. So I put that diamond plate on the edge of my bench. And I'm going to take my thumb right here like that. And I'm going to drag, I'm, I'm, so that I got, I'm up against the thousand grit side. I'm going to pull the saw like this. One, and I'll flip it over, and I'll do the other side. Push it? Yeah, I'm pushing down. No, but you're, you're pushing that time. Is that what you're looking? Pushing, what do you mean? Oh, on the other one, you were pulling the teeth? Oh, no, no, doesn't matter. All you're doing is just, you're, actually, you're filing off the outside of the tooth to reduce the set. And I do just do one at a time, then I'll come over, I'll make a cut. Now, what I want to be aware of is that saw drifting to the right or to the left? If you have more set on one side than the other, then the saw is going to follow the path of least resistance, and the path of least resistance is going to be the saw that gives it the mo uh, the the side that gives it the most space. So if this if these teeth are sticking out farther, the saw is going to want to go off like that. Same thing if it's going that way. So if that was the case, and I'd say, okay, I've got too much set on this side, I would come over here and I would do another stroke. Come in and try it. And if it's corrected, great. If it isn't corrected, i got to go do it one more time. Sometimes you go too far. And how do you know when it's go too far? Well, you can't saw. It just gets stuck in there. It's jammed. Then you got to go back and redo your set again. But it's not something that you uh, can't recover from if you don't get it right the first time. What was the question? Oh, yeah, yeah. What was the question, Frick? How do I determine... The appropriate set when appropriate restoring set? Oh. a handsaw. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't answer that quite the way I should. Um, I'm going to I'm going to work under the assumption that everybody watching tonight is building furniture, building cabinets. That means you're dealing with dry woods. Wet woods would be a different situation altogether. And a lot of the saws you're going to buy have way too much set. I want when when I'm ripping, if you got the right amount of set, that thing will stay right on track. You'll start, this is this is a little bit more than I would like. Meaning when I start cutting with this saw, it will track and it'll get me a nice straight cut. Now let's see if I can make a cut right beside it and fairly thin. That's a little bit heavy, but it's okay. The wider your set, the wider your set, the more your saw is sitting in a big groove like this. So if, if uh, I'll try to do it this way. That's how I used to teach it, except in England. You don't stand in front of an audience and do that. So 
if I have very near, if I have wide set, my saw is here like this, and my saw wobbles back and forth, and I'm left steering the saw. When all I should really be doing is aiming it initially and then push, pull, push, pull. Once started, it should continue. But if it's big wide set like that, it's flopping all over and you're going to end up with a real, oh, terrible cut. So you want just enough set so that the saw is allowed to slide down through, but it's still making contact with the side so that it cannot go off to one side or the other. The kerf prevents it. You don't want it jammed, but you don't want a lot of space. And I think everybody sells saws with too much set. The standard dovetail saw has three to four thou per side. Well, if I make mine two thou per side and it works and doesn't bind, it's going, it, then three or four is too much. You don't need that much. And here's the problem. There's this, there's this tooth line, right? So there's what it looks like. You get points of your teeth sticking out like that. And those teeth are sticking out and they're raking the side wall of either side of the kerf. And the more they stick out, the more that gets scratched up. Well, if you take a really rough, two really rough surfaces, that would be like taking two pieces of, um, shoot, never have what I want. So here, there's a rough sawn surface. There's a rough sawn surface. You put them together, you're not going to get a very good glue joint, are you? But the smoother the surface is, the, look up, there's a great example. So this is smooth and that's smooth. You put them together and boy, you get a nice tight joint. But those two rough surfaces, you get a terrible joint. Okay. So the more you can pull in your set without binding, the smoother those side walls are going to be, the better it's going to, the, the better, the better it's going to be for a glue joint if you're using your saw to cut a mortise and tenon, a, a tenon portion of a mortise and tenon or a dovetail. Go ahead, Frick, next. Good question. Uh, well, have Megan give some shout outs. Okay, here. Megan, you ready? I'm down and out. But I have. Not, not working? Like, yeah. I'm, not, I, I'm not hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yep. <clears throat> okay, well, I can't see any of the chat since we last said, told everyone to tag me. So, but before that, I had um, Gary Burnett. Hi, Gary. And um, Philip Lawrence. Phil. And Mark Smith is here. And Mark Smith, Canadian. But I, I once you told everyone to tag me, I my internet's been down since. Okay. So hopefully she'll get fixed and we'll be able to uh, sneaky well, beats. We'll see some of them. Um, this next question comes from Dora Seeley. She wants to know. She says, "Hi, Rob. How do I get my husband to listen to me like he does to you?" <laughs> Hmm. How do I get my husband? Well, actually, here, Doris, we do listen Dora. to you. Here's the problem. We know you're right. We know you always have the best ideas. Is my wife listening? <laughs> She's out there, yeah. Oh, Be careful. She's not listening, then. But <laughs> we don't, we, our egos can't handle it. So you just have to, you have to present it in such a way that you make us think it was our idea. You do that, you win every time. Or just give it a little bit of time. But can't rub it in her face because we have huge egos and uh, really uh, thin skin. How's that for marital advice? Um, married. You, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, what I'm married. How many years? Oh, you're supposed to know that. I know. I'm, I'm doing the math. Married in 1985. How many? 35. 36. 30, 36 in August. Oh, I learned something. Do you want to uh, show the video of the new shop? Oh, yeah. What time is it? We're quarter after eight, so we're past the halfway mark. Okay, how many people do we have on? 820. All right, so here's what I want to tell you. Um, we were, Jake and I, were, we, we knew we weren't going to be able to do this tonight because we lose reception if we go over there. But I wanted to show you what's going on. I think you're going to really like this, and uh, I really want your feedback. So roll it, Frick. All right. Hi, folks. We're, so we're filming this. Just a couple hours before our broadcast, because we couldn't, we lose reception if we try to come over here. So, but I wanted to show you what we're, what's going on. So this is going to be the new, actually the name is going to be the Joe Power Memorial Workshop. I'll explain that at some other point. This part is going to be the classroom. So we've got our lumber rack in place. That's going to stay there. And we've got room in here. What do we figure, 15 benches? There'll be 15 benches, nicely spaced. Everybody got lots of room. My bench will be up there. That'll be the front of the class. 
We've, uh, the glass is in, so by this time next week, the glass will be back in place there. And Junior, who's working on this, will finish the walls. We're putting half-inch MDF over this pegboard, because can you, you can't create that effect. If you sit here and look at the pegboard, you'll fall over, it makes you dizzy. So that's gonna go all the way around. Um, we're gonna, we've got some exercise equipment that's gonna go at the back of the room that the guys can use and we use. This, uh, the rooms haven't been done, but this is gonna be our quiet room. It'll be eight by 10, is that we figured? Eight by 10 quiet room, it'll be insulated, so anybody that needs a break during the day. And then we've got two bathrooms, wheelchair accessible, that are going in here. Over here, this is gonna be an open hall to the emergency exit. But this back end, which is eight feet by 16, is going to be our, we'll call it a commercial kitchen. Now, before I show you that, I just want to take you over here and give you a quick view of my new shop. Uh, it's close. We're waiting for, we ordered, we, we got to put a sea can on the outside of that far wall so that we can put our dust collector and our compressor to get them off the shop floor into the noise. Anyway, we couldn't get a sea can in there because of the tight squeeze, so we actually ordered one that comes apart and it'll arrive Wednesday, we'll build it in place. The dust collector is supposed to be here when? A week and a half. From Oneida. And that'll come on an angle across here and pick everything up. So all the machines are in place. Some of the stuff is just excess machinery we gotta sell off. There's an eight inch joiner there. There's a Excalibur 24 inch, no, 16 inch or 18, I can't remember, scroll saw. Got a Delta band saw. Got a uh, 15 inch or 14 inch planer. And then the rest of the stuff is going to stay here. Sometime this week, I hope, we'll start making the transition and bringing the stuff over. And uh, of course, the scaffolding will be, will be out of here. We're just now in the online workshop building all the uh, shop furniture that goes in here. Lights are all in place. So, in case you didn't know, this is our Purple Heart Project classroom. And uh, as soon as this crazy COVID stuff is out of our hair and we can resume our classes, we'll come here for probably seven in the morning. We'll eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner here. We stay until 11 o'clock at night, in case you're interested in a marathon of a class. It's six day class, six. And um, so this, as I mentioned, that's going to be the kitchen. This is going to be our mess hall. Now I'm a huge MASH fan. You'll probably already know that. Love that show. And uh, I love the military connection with what we do with the combat wounded vets. So I wanted to keep it, I wanted to make it a theme. I also wanted to keep it uh, light and uh, whimsical. So I'm just going to show you the first part. So I, I, uh, I had an idea and Harold, who works with us now, great guy, Harold said, Rob, I got the guy for you. So he introduced me to uh, Kevin Lasky. And Kevin is a, a, a trim carpenter who likes to do paintings as a hobby, has for his entire life. And I told him what I wanted. He'd never done one this big before. So I'm going to show you the completed first mural. So if you're familiar with MASH, this will be a, this scene, I think, came out of the very first of uh, the pilot episode. So this is Radar. They had just finished playing football. And he said, choppers, and everybody said, I don't hear anything, wait for it. And then off in the distance came the two choppers bringing in the evac choppers. So we had to, it was a fairly small scene and we had to expand it to this big wall. So Kevin put the ambulance in there and I thought he did a fantastic job on the tent, which gave me an idea that I'll tell you about in a minute. And then uh, of course you see the choppers coming in, as I mentioned. Over here, we had a big space to fill up. And I said, well, why not a latrine? So we did, and if you know anything about MASH, you'll recognize this, these hairy legs with the pink dress. I can't tell you who it is, you gotta know that. So what we're going to do, this is the plan. We're going to have green canvas, army green canvas fabric on the ceiling. So the, the lights in here will hang. We can, you know, we should, I thought we should get, find those round hanging lights that go over each table. There'll be three tables with eight seats at each. So this wall, is, uh, I, we were, to my friend Tony, who's a, also a combat wounded vet, has been collecting stuff for us. So we've got a big, uh, a big thing of camo netting, and we got this uh, tent, but what does it stink? And I, th and I got thinking, when I saw this, I thought, my goodness, Kevin could do that. 
So if you can imagine, by, by the way, we're, we're putting in four by four posts that'll be painted army green, that'll look like tent posts, are going to cover each of these uh, dividers between the panels. And that'll hopefully create that illusion that you're in the mess looking out at this scene. So this, this panel is going to be uh, just painted like uh, army uh, tent canvas. And then what we're gonna do, so as not to take away from this big mural, is we're gonna have a series of smaller ones. So there'll be, a, there'll be a, a window in the tent here and you'll see a mural there. One will be uh, Colonel Potter with his horse, Sophie. We've got one that's gonna have a uh, great suggestion, my daughter, Krissa. So if you remember a scene that Colonel Flagg was in and he was hiding in a garbage can outside of the mess hall, perfect space. And, he had, and, the, and he's got the, the, the lid is up and he's looking up and uh, Charles is talking to him. So that'll put two more characters into it. And then we will come up with some more that we're gonna use over here. But, so the idea will be tent green and then windows and, in, and looking out each window, you'll see some scene familiar to MASH, try to get all the characters into it. All right, oh, and uh, right up here. So it's going to say in that clear section, MASH in the block letters, best care anywhere. And then MASH is going to have its own meaning here. My fr the first idea was military always served here, but uh, Joe Bright came up with a good one, so we'll uh, kind of put it out to you. If you come up with an idea on the acronym or what M-A-S-H can stand for in terms of what we do here. Love to hear it. All right, see you back at the bench. Good? Yes. Aren't they still no. watching? Well, they oh, are. Right, we're the delay. <laughs> So uh, I wish that was actually live because I'd love to hear what you had to say about it. But big, big shout out to, uh, to uh, Kevin Lasky. He did a fantastic job. He was nervous. I said he wasn't nervous, but it was a challenge. I mean, he's used to doing paintings this big, and I gave him a wall that was, uh, how big is that anyway? It's 10 feet, 10 feet tall. 24. By 20, 26. 26 feet. I think he did a fantastic job. I just, I, I love his work because it has an element of realism with a little bit of uh, animation, and it just came off beautifully. Can't wait to see the rest of it. It's going to be one first-class mess. Next question, Frick. All right, next question comes from... And by the way, Harold found him for me, so another big kudos to Harold. John Kaserowski. Hi, John. In Florida. I know, John. Where we should be right now. <laughs> how often do you sharpen the saws that you use regularly, and how long does it take? Uh, how often? If you're talking about a dovetail saw, how often would I sharpen my dovetail saw? I've never a couple seen years. You, you replace it. Uh, yeah, sure, I get bored with it and make a new one. But you could probably, if you were cutting dovetails every weekend, I would guess and say that you might have to sharpen your saw every year and a half. Just a touch up. If you got you got to remember that that tooth will stay sharp a whole lot longer than a hand plane will stay sharp cutting a piece of wood. I should say, let me rephrase that: the saw will continue to cut wood long after a hand plane wouldn't. Plain wood. Hi, Chloe. Do you want to see our all-star employee? So, uh, and the the big panel saws. I don't use them enough to warrant them being sharpened very often. So it's, it, it's not something you do often. If you've got to remember, um, a saw, we still have dovetail saws. Look at this. We still have dovetail saws that, uh, that could quite possibly be 100 years old. And uh, there's still tons of blade left on them. So they, they didn't get sharpened a whole lot because they didn't need to be. Oh, by the way, that belonged to, uh, this saw belonged to... Um, Leonard. John Leonard Robishaw, World War II vet, that we're going to name our new dovetail saw that I'm patterning after pattern, patterning, patterning aft. This is going to be the Len Rob the Len Robishaw saw, and it'll have something on the back engraved about his service, World War II. He uh, fascinating story. His son John is going to tell the story when we announce that. So I was finally ready. And how long does it take? Probably, I think I timed it one time. It takes me seven minutes to sharpen a dovetail saw. So, and I'm not fast, so it doesn't take long. Easy to do. Next, Frick. Okay, next. next question comes from Bill Tiffin in, Hi, Edmund, Bill. in Edmonton. 
Edmonton, Alberta. Correct. <laughs> Gold. Do you put do you put less rake on the first teeth when sharpening your saws? So, if you're talking about my dovetail saw, which I have to assume he is, this saw is specifically designed. Jake, I'm getting a turn the thing the link thing off and turn it back on. I'm getting a bad signal. You want me to wait? Uh, yeah, just give us one second. Any more coming in, Megan? Bets? Are you back on? Yeah, they can hear you. Just the video is getting choppy. Who? Kev? Hey, Kev. And Ray. Cool Ray from Louisiana. Ray Dorr, yep. Not a boy, Ray. Okay, are we back? What? I'm red. It just went yellow. Green. Okay, I'll keep an eye on it. Are we back? Yeah, the wireless signal is... Okay. So, the question he asked, is there a difference in the rake? Yes, there is. Remember, the rake is the angle that the face of the tooth engages the wood. So, on my dovetail saw, and... Uh, you might you might interpret this as a bit of a plug, but that that's the price of of the free show. What's all important? Literally, this is the uh, this is the make or break. When you're getting ready to cut a dovetail, and you've got your line, if your saw if your saw cut is anywhere but where you want it to be in relation to that line, then it's in the wrong spot and it has to be fixed. If it has to be fixed, it has to be done with a chisel. Very difficult to do. You're opposing the grain. Just going to be rough. So you need to have 100% control over where that saw starts cutting. What I discovered from teaching literally thousands of people to do this, the traditional dovetail saw has the same number of teeth, same, same cutting angle on all of them. So they would be in here like this, and in an attempt to get it to start to cut, it would, be bite, it would be biting on them, and they'd be pushing and pushing. What happens when you push? How do you push? Less control you have. The thing would finally start to cut, but it wouldn't be anywhere near where they want. They were just happy that it started, but zero control. So what I decided to do was to te dedicate the first two inches of my blade, 22 teeth per inch instead of 15. So the first, there's a, that change. Then I took the cutting face, and I relaxed it. Now, when I say relax it, I mean instead of it being like this, so if you have a zero-degree cutting face, the, that tooth, imagine this. You are about to try to push that straight, straight through that wood. You can imagine the amount of resistance you get. But if you angle your tooth off a little bit, it almost slides over the top, and it'll leave a little score on there, but it certainly doesn't dig in aggressively. So the first two inches are small teeth, relaxed cut relaxing uh, angle allow you to go in and do that just create a little bit of a groove just enough to hold the teeth so when the big teeth engage they're not jumping around they're already set on a track and away you go with tremendous precision when i sharpen this i actually would ignore these first i don't these don't need to be sharp they just need to be in in fact they'll i could almost say the duller they are the better because then it just offers even less resistance, and just all you want to do is just score, just enough to catch your thumbnail. Well, and they would they would also be a very a very hard to wear tooth anyway. Well, they, yeah, they they don't get much they don't get much work. But here's the problem: if you only sharpen from here to here, you're eventually going to have this tooth line lower than that one, and that kind of throws it off a little bit. So I would say every second time you sharpen. Now, remember, that might be every six years. You're going to want to go in, and, and you're also going to want to sharpen these so that you drop that tooth line so it's down here where this tooth line is. But you don't you, you have that relaxed, that relaxed cutting face, which makes it really easy to start your saw. Which, by the way, a crosscut saw has uh, uh, about 15 degree. That cutting face is about 15 degrees. And that's why a crosscut saw starts so easy. It doesn't offer you a lot of resistance. It's that aggressive dig in and go of that 
zero degree on the rake angle that makes the saw cut so fast, but also cut so aggressively that it's difficult to control when you first start. Good question. Thanks for the uh, plug. Next, Rick. Tyler Bloom in Martinsville, Hi, Tyler. Saskatchewan. How many sharpenings Canadian. for an average backsaw would you do before resetting the teeth? Um, Ian Kirby said you could go three or four times before you, because you got to remember. So your your uh, if if this is your saw plate, your there's the there's the base of your tooth, right? And there's your set. So we're three we're two thou out here. Every time you sharpen. You're lo you're losing, 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 losing until eventually, you're you you've moved your gullet. So the gullet is the base of the tooth. You've moved your gullet down into here, so you no longer have any set. So uh, depending on how aggressive you sharpen as well, but I would certainly say you'd be safe on three sharpenings before you have to worry about the set. But you'll know because it'll start to bind if you don't have enough, and then you got to go in and put some set on the teeth. It, this stuff sounds complicated. Of course it is. At least, uh, pardon me. Let me rephrase that. It sounds complicated because if you don't know anything about it, you're just approaching this for the first time. You think, oh, wow, what is all this? But really, I'm telling you, once you learn about it, figure it out, get the gear, this really isn't hard. I would say it's easier. I'm going to say that it is easier to learn to sharpen your dovetail saw than it is to freehand sharpen your plane blade. Or chisel. Go ahead, Frank. Okay, next question comes from where'd it go? Uh, Aaron Fenn in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Hi, Aaron. Uh, please that, I, know, that name, I know that name. Yeah, well. Aaron's always with us. He says, please offer your recommendation of file size and brand, if you have one. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, good question. And, really good question. And he wants to know... Uh, I got a short memory. Frank, hit me with the second part after I do the first. Well, he's, he's saying more specifically for the dovetail saw, which one would okay. you use? We're, we're actually going to start selling these, Aaron. In fact, uh, because people ask me for them all the time, I've got a bunch of them in here. Look. My glasses on. i got a bunch in here that are still, that I this we just never did. I, I brought in a whole bunch with the intent. We had, reason we hadn't offered them for sale yet, excuse me, we we're trying to find a handle to fit them. So, Grow Bay... G R G R O B E T. There's an umlaut in there somewhere. Made in Switzerland. Switcher. Are, uh, Switzerland. Are, I think, the best. So here's the problem. you got to remember, the demand, the professional demand for things like saw files has long since gone away. Right? There, how many professional saw sharpeners do you know? Uh, my other, uh, my... Uh, my samples. Up top. Okay, back to what I was saying. The profession, the, there, nobody, I don't think anybody on here knows of somebody who sharpens saws for a living. So because of that, there's no demand from on a professional level for these files. So the only demand left is the people that are doing it as a hobby. And that does a terrible thing to the supply. Well, what you end up having is you find that uh, a lot of the files will come to you. You're wanting, if you're doing a dovetail saw, you want a four or f four, five or six inch double extra slim tapered file. So that's what it looks like. Okay. But if your file is going to be a, a right angle triangle, not a right angle, an equilateral, equilateral triangle. Is that what that is, Frick? There's a triangle where the angles are all the same. The school teacher. Here's what it should look like. Here's what he they teaches Jim. Here's what they start looking like, Mr. D. Round it over like that. This will produce nice, sharp gullets. This will produce waves. So you want you want good files. So Grow Bay seemed to make the best. Four inch. Six inch, somewhere in that range, double extra slim taper file. I don't know what the rest of that means. I just know that that's what you use to cut the cut them. It's in. It's easy. We, they're not expensive at all. We'll. I'll try to make it a point in the next couple of months to get those up on our site so that we'll uh, we can be this supply for you. 
Okay, deal. What was the second part of his question? Well, he was looking for one specifically. Oh, oh, uh, for dovetail, so, yeah. yeah, for your dovetail. So. Yeah. Another one? Yep. All right, this one comes from Pastor Dennis Williams in New Matamoros, Ohio. Hey, Dennis. In, he, w- in, in where? New Matamoros. New Matamoros. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Do most saws need sharpening right out of the box? Uh, that is going to be a factor of the price. If you're buying a premium dovetail saw, it should come literally ready out of the box. And if it doesn't, I would return it. If you're buying the uh, hardware store, I'm going to tailor my comments. I'm not going to say junk. If you're buying the hardware store variety, then don't expect much. If you're spending $20 for your dovetail saw versus $250, then you don't have a whole lot of claim to uh, um, a great saw ready to go at the $20 level. At the $250 level, that thing should be able to sing out of the box. And by the way, ours sing. Go ahead, Frick. All right, next question is from Wally Cox in Monticello, Indiana. Hi, Wally. Can a crosscut saw be changed and sharpened as a rip cut and done so easily? Well, yes. It's a fair bit of filing. Um, It's the same steel, right? You're just going to have to come. So your crosscut saw has got... Uh, the teeth on your crosscut saw have what we, that, what we call that fleam. So that saw is going to be angled. The tooth is going to be angled like that, 30 degrees. The, um, the, uh, the rake angle is going to be 15 degrees. So you're going to have to come in. You're going to file straight across like that. I mean, you can do it. You've already got your spacing, but you're going to have your file so that your cutting face is more like zero degrees, and you got to file through a fair bit of metal in order to get rid of any of that existing angle that was on there, which means once you filed, you're probably going to have to, A, you're definitely going to have to go and redo the set, and you're probably also going to, unless you're used to doing this, you're probably going to have to go in and joint it as well because you end up putting more pressure in one spot than another, and you're filing a lot in order to do that. So the... Chances that you're going to keep all those tops of the teeth right in the same line, depending on your skill. It would probably be a lot easier to go the other way. Well, it would be even easier to just go buy the exact saw you want, unless you've got 10 crosscuts and you don't need them and you want to make one a a rip. But, yeah, it's possible. But in order to do it, you would basically have to remove the entire tooth. You would be taking out a lot of it. That's why I say you'd... If you're really careful, and you won't change your, your, the shape of each tooth. If you're super careful, you won't change the height of each tooth, but you'll definitely have to add set. Something funny? or? Yeah, Super oh. Dave's cracking jokes over here. <laughs> next, next question. Any more vets, Megan? Wow. Don't forget we're, our draw tonight. We're giving away uh, the new mini shooting board for each $1,000 increment in donations to the Purple Heart Project that we use to run this program. Uh, we're, also, we're also drawing for a dead cat sweater to keep you as warm as you could possibly be, a Captain's Always Right hoodie, and the Naughty Girl t-shirt. We have our t-shirts. I, oh, I forgot to say hi to Angie and Lynn. So out in uh, the other side of St. John lives Angie and her sister Lynn. Angie's part of our team. Angie works, and Lynn put all of our t-shirts together, and they package them all up nice and neat. I'm going to show you this. So when you buy a t-shirt, it'll come with a picture of me and Angie. That was the first time I met her. And that's her A, symbol of equality. And it's all nicely packaged up, and they do a fantastic job. Pete Ambrose? Yep. Hey, Brother Pete. Always good to hear from you. Did you talk, did you mention the oranges? Pardon? The oranges. Oh, yes. What was his name? Nathan. Nathan from Arizona. So I got a, I got a, uh, is Nathan on there? I don't know. I hope he is. So we got a package back the other day, just two days ago. It was one of our boxes. So it was about that long, about that wide, about that deep. And, you know, we get a package back almost every day. Something gets screwed up somewhere in the mail. And it's always like, oh, now what? Usually the post office is doing something wrong. Newman. 
Anyway, I looked at it and I thought, well, wait a minute. We don't put that much tape on it because it's all taped up. And I looked a little closer and there's a little declaration sticker on there. Now, the reason why I was confused is because all of our stickers were still on there. And on the declaration sticker, it says 20 oranges. I said, but I don't know if you're going to get them across the border because you can't bring citrus fruits in. And then all of a sudden, 20 oranges showed up. And uh, we took a picture. Everybody, was, they were fantastic. So, Nathan, if you're on there, thank you. And don't hesitate to do that again. But, my goodness, the price you paid on shipping, I feel bad. It was a much appreciated treat because everybody in this room would, would typically be in Florida this time of year. I always teach down at the, at the store in Orlando and Clearwater, and the whole family has to go because I need someone to carry the tools. I don't know why they stay for three weeks, but anyway. Heavy tools, lots of recovery time. Yeah. So uh, they all go and enjoy themselves while I work, and because of COVID, we can't go this year. So that little bit of sunshine that you sent was very much appreciated. Everybody got one. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that up, Frick. Appreciate that. I didn't bring it up. Oh, Megan, Megan sorry. Uh, you know, my comments kind of But I did get direction. one, and they were delicious, so thank you. And they were really you good. You got one? Yeah, I got two, actually. Oh, well, we, we got those at Sobeys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Even worse. Go ahead. What's, what's our next, uh, next question? Our next question comes from Norfolk United Kingdom. They're saying the video froze up. Yeah. If they, refre if they refresh, it works good. Okay. They said it's back. Who is it in Norfolk? It is Lucas Pentelli. Hey, Lucas. And you're staying up late, brother. Great to have you. And he wants to know what made you decide to make your own saws. Oh, how much time do we have? 15 minutes. Well, 10 minutes. Okay, so I'm going to uh, try to do this quickly. I don't think I've ever told the story. <clears throat> so to make a long story short, by the time we, we, by the time we had five children, um, my woodworking business was full tilt, super busy, but extremely unprofitable, and I was down. To, I remember one point I had $75 left to my name. I thought, this isn't going to work. After 11 years of doing it, I just could not see how we could make money. Got an email out of the blue from a guy named Tom Lee Nelson. I had no idea who he was. Wanted to know if I'd be interested in selling Lee Nelson tools in Canada. Well, he was only about three hours away. I'm in New Brunswick. He's in Maine. So I drove down. I was really impressed. Somebody asked about saws. The reason I said yes to his offer was because he, it was the first time that I'd found a dovetail saw that actually had ripped teeth. Every dovetail saw I ever got by mail order from prior to that had cross cut teeth. And I always thought, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But if dovetailing is a ripping operation, why do these people make saws with cross cut teeth? Well, simple reason. Because they had no idea how to use the saw. So I took Lee Nelson up on his offer. I thought it would be an interesting part-time venture. I'm talking fast to get this over. Um, 30 days later, it was a full-time venture. And I really enjoyed it. I got to meet all these people. I traveled coast to coast. Canada is a big country. I couldn't afford to fly to Victoria to do a wood show for three days, fly back to New Brunswick, only to fly back out the next weekend to do Vancouver. So I would stay there. I would stay in these various cities. I would rent a wood shop, whether it's a techno school or a high school that had a wood shop that wasn't being used at night. I would rent it. I'd go in there, and uh, I would have people that were at the wood show buying tools come to the class. Well, I sold thousands of Lee Nelson saws, literally thousands. And I would guess 60% of the people that bought it could never start it accurately. Didn't matter how good it looked, didn't matter how fast it cut. If you couldn't start it, you were lost. And uh, I used to go back to Lee Nelson from, after teaching all these people over these number of years. And I said, you know what? These guys can't get this. We need to fix this. No, wasn't interested. One thing I noticed was if you're 65 years old and you live in Canada, you've got a bit of arthritis in your hand. And if you're trying to manipulate a small... Uh, a small knob on a plane, it's very difficult. Here's a great example. So this is a Lee Nelson 10 and a quarter bench rabbit plane. Trying to turn that adjuster knob is so difficult, especially if you have tired, achy hands. So we came up with the idea of what we call the adjuster. And this was a five spoke replacement for both Lee Nelson and Wood River and gives you all kinds of leverage so you can make the adjustment. It's a lifesaver for some folks. There we have them in stock and we sell a boatload of them. Well, that was just one example of me addressing the feedback that I was getting when I was out teaching. I had this idea one time because everybody trying to learn dovetails 
if, if, if there's so much bad advice, how many times have you read an article where the author said, if your line is here, saw over here, and then when you're done, just pair back to the line? What a stupid idea. You put the saw where you want it. You don't put the saw over here. If you're going to do it like that, use a chainsaw. Put your saw where you want it. Like Alan Peters said, your saw cut is the last thing you do before you put glue on the two pieces. You don't come in and pair. Maybe if you have to fix a mistake, but you don't intentionally do that. Well, we had people struggling. The saw would cut nice and fast once you got it going, but if it wasn't in the right spot. I had this idea. What if you had little tiny teeth that were really easy to start? And then you just did that at the front of the saw. The back of the saw had big, fast-cutting teeth, so you weren't there all night. Lee Nelson never got that idea because I was just about to go down and tell, go down and tell him on my next visit. My wife overheard me. She said, you know what? He's not interested in your ideas. Why don't you keep it to yourself? We might need it sometime. I thought she was crazy, but I listened to her. A year later, I had been cut loose and was looking for a way to feed my family. Went out to visit some saw makers on the west coast of the United States. They were nice guys, but they were way too busy. And I went home disappointed, thinking that, oh, I'm going to have to do this myself. Well, I found out that it's not that tough. If you, uh, if you have the desire, if you have a will, you will find the way. And I turned my woodworking equipment into metalworking equipment. I started cutting brass on the table saw. Started milling brass with routers. All the stuff that my friends later told me that you sh my machinist friend said, you can't do that. Well, I've been doing it. Took an old general drill press and made a milling machine out of it to cut the slot in the brass. Slow going. Now we sell almost as many saws as we can make. And we have a whole team of people in here doing various parts. I still am involved in the production of every saw. I enjoy it. I love it. And I love, I love testing that saw and having it cut just exactly like it does. The one behind me does. So you can be assured if you buy the saw, I promise you it will work. If not, we will make it, fi we will fix it. But it'll go out working. So hope that answers the question. Next question, Frick. Um, Derek Knowles. And hey, Derek. Petit Rocher, which is actually just... Petit Rocher in New Brunswick. Northern New Brunswick. He said, my father used to sharpen his own and other people's hand saws. He used a tool to set the kerf. Is that the only way to do that, or is it necessary to have such a tool? Tool to set the kerf. So, meaning well, he's talking about the set. So, some, I mean, you'll, you may see, you'll see some old books where they would use a screwdriver. They would put a flat screwdriver in between two teeth and twist it and, and bend, the, uh, bend the teeth enough. Now, that's fine if you're, if you're ripping uh, construction lumber, but for furniture construction, I don't think you're going to get away with that. So you do need to have a saw set. Uh, I know uh, Tools for Working Wood in New York, uh, Joel, makes, makes, uh, makes and sells a saw set you can get there. But you know what? You can find those on eBay. You can find them at, uh, I guess it's a little tough now, flea markets because we can't get out among people. But there's lots of them are still around because there were, they were plentiful at one time. Whether or not you can find one that's going to work specifically for a really fine saw, like a dovetail saw, I still haven't modified one to my satisfaction yet, but I'm working on it. Next, Rick. Uh, next one comes from CJ in the Washington, D.C. area. Hey, CJ. He says, is it better to use a pistol grip saw set or a nail punch as a saw set? Well, I would use a pistol grip. I mean, if you were a pro that was doing this 40, 50 hours a week, you could probably do it with a butter knife. But if you're an amateur that's doing it once in a while, get the pistol grip. Um, I know, he, you know, there are ones where they, you would set it down and you would literally punch, you would tap it. I can't, I remember seeing it done, never done it. And what you would do is you would be, you would have an anvil again and you're hitting that tooth, bending it toward the anvil. Well, the... The uh, pistol grip ones are doing the same thing. They're doing a little more control. They're that little punch, that little, uh, what do we call it? Not a punch. Can't think of the word. A little pin comes out, pushes that tooth over, against, lays it against the anvil. The anvil controls how much it goes so that all the set is going to be identical on both sides. Yeah, I get that one. Brick? How come they're not coming bang, bang, bang? Because I'm working on... Organizing the draw. Mm. Um, file we did. 
Barry Doxy in South Benfleet, Essex, United Kingdom. How do you create hey, How do you create an even fine set on fine teeth? I've not found a saw set that does this well. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the problem. Like I said, when I do when I set my teeth with that one, I have to go back in and stone them. Because it, it nobody seems to make one that has an anvil that is small enough. Now, I should be I mean we're here we're back talking about the same topic again. Follow me, Jake. We should we should be able to go in and take that anvil off and do something to um, to reduce it just needs to the amount of flare, huh? It just needs to be padded. Well, we can go in there and do something. So you're you're going to have to you're going to have to be able to modify it yourself. Now I was looking at I was looking at this one. And this one works completely different. Where is it? This one. So here's one. So there's your anvil. Now you can see how much, can you see how much slope there is on that? But what you do on this one is this. Uh, oh, you move that. Up oh, no, 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 no. That's just for the size of the tooth. That, 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 this, this does not have an adjustable. This is not adjustable at all. That just has one size. But, hey, you know what we could do? We could go in and we could easily, we could grind that back. That's what we'll do. It's going to take a little bit of work, but we should be able to fix it. Somebody wants to come in and say hello. You want to come in and say hello? What's with the mask? Oh. Yeah, he likes wearing them, actually. Does he? Little COVID generation. <laughs> hey, you see. hey, let me show you something. What what is this? What is it? Is it good? Yep. Eats it by the spoonful. Okay, you, you don't get well, into my uh, chisels. Huh? May, as, may as well do your wrap up. Okay, so I'll just show you real quick because Luther wanted me to show you this. We had made these for a video. So there's your rip tooth, right? So you, there's your teeth, flat on the face. Cutting edge consists of this and this. There's your cross cut. There's a slope here, slope here. So that point consists of three surfaces, this one, this one, and this one. And that's how they go in and do the cutting a little bit different. Okay. So final thing, if you haven't already registered, hurry and do it. Register for the draw. It doesn't cost you anything. If you want to donate and be part of this fantastic Purple Heart Project, where we change, literally, save lives. And all we're doing is just giving these guys something to focus on, and uh, guys and gals, because we've, uh, we've had several female uh, uh, veterans as well. Uh, but, of course, it costs money to do. And that doesn't matter. We would pay for it ourselves. But if you want some of the blessings of being able to do it, by all means, join us. And tonight we're giving away the, the mini shooting boards. Um, we're giving away the, the hoodie, the naughty, naughty girl, girl, and the, the dead, dead cat, cat sweater, sweater which, which is my favorite piece of apparel. Uh, we, got, we, I, uh, we had a guy, a friend of mine the other day came, came and bought four of them. To to give to, to, one, he's given to somebody, a friend, and three, he's given to people that make him fun of him wearing his all the time. I don't know why he's giving them, but he is. Nice and warm. PatSecretGarden.com. Big, big thank you to Moose. Okay, okay we ready, ready to go, go for it? Ready to uh, draw? No, no, just you, you, you showed, showed the mini shooting, shooting boards again. again. Yeah. Well, am, am, am I stalling, stalling for time? Give me another question. question. No, no, I need, need the time to organize the time. drawing. All right. Uh, hey, do, we have any, do we have any vets that uh, need to be shouted out to? All right, I'm, I'm pretty much ready. Just ready? Almost. So, so uh, Manoli, you remember Manoli, Manoli the, the guitarist? guitarist. Uh, because, because of the storm going on, wasn't able to be here tonight, but he'll be here in two weeks with some new tunes. So if you enjoyed hearing Manoli, he'll be back. And we'll be back in two weeks. Topic will be announced in one week. Give you a chance to ask your questions. Big thank you to Luther. Does a ton of work. Thank you to Super Dave. Thank you to Ken. Um, Rex, Megan, Jake. Uh, Frick. Frick. I, I should also mention, say thank you to my daughter, daughter Erica, who uh, prepares, prepares dinner for us 
the, the crew, crew every uh, every, every night, night that we do this. this. Just makes it a little easier us to have a little extra time, time to get things ready and, and make sure we don't have any bugs in our system. system. Yeah. Okay. okay. How, How many, many are we giving away? Do we know? We're, we're two. Uh, we're, yeah, we're at 2,100. Two, so two mini shooting boards and um, three, three garments. garments. So, so let's do the naughty girl first. We had a lot of big donations tonight, so thank you. We had a lot of big donations tonight, so thank you to everyone who donated. Well, thank, thank you very much, much folks. We appreciate it. it. And, and, and you will... Uh, the, the people, people who donate, donate already know why they're doing it. it. So, um, yeah, yeah, just a big uh, a big thank, thank you to the vets that sacrificed so much for us. us. And I, I hope they feel a little more appreciated when they watch this, and especially those who get to come to our program. Please apply. Are you ready? Naughty, naughty girl? girl? Yep. Naughty, naughty girl's, girl's going, going where? This, this evening's, evening's naughty, naughty girl, girl is Mark Neuer in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Congratulations, Congratulations, Mark. Let, Let us know what size you wear. wear. Just kidding. Or significant other. Uh, what's, what's next? Next is going to be the uh, hoodie. Captain's hoodie. Captain's, Captain's always right. Winner of the hoodie is Mike Costello in North Carolina. Hey, Mike, congratulations. congratulations. And, and now who's, who's the lucky owner, owner of a dead cat? cat? Tonight's dead cat is Greg Brelsford in Wisconsin. Hey, he'll, he'll need it. Greg, Greg congratulations. congratulations. I know Wisconsin's lovely and warm in the middle of February. Now, two, uh, two, two mini shooting boards. Who's the first one going to? First one is going to... Are we going to give away something else tonight, Jake? We talked about Mike Bailey in Bayport, New York. Mike in New York. Congratulations, Mike. And this is the last one. Last but not least, winner is Daryl Brook in Australia. <laughs> Daryl in Australia. Congratulations, Daryl. May, May take, take a little longer to get to you, but it'll be on its way. way. And, and what are you uh, saying? saying? Come here, McLaren. He's, He's just uh, having his two cents, cents worth. Thank, Thank you for joining us tonight. I hope, the, I hope you benefited, you benefited from, from it. We're always open for your ideas on topics, topics that you'd like us to discuss. Um, communicate with us. You go to our website, robcosman.com. You can communicate with us through there, and we'll respond. And I don't think I have anything else left. Have a, have, have a lovely, lovely weekend. weekend. Hope things warm up. And to all my friends in Texas, we have a ton of vets that have been with us. I hope everything warms up for you folks and everybody survives, comes out of this thing. Trust me. I, I, they were, I know when they saw the first snowstorm, they thought how great it was. I said, wait till your eighth snowstorm. Then all of a sudden it loses its allure. Anyway, hope everything is fine. Have a good night, guys.